It is amazing uh, to me that we get this opportunity to worship together on this Sunday morning. Uh, it is a great morning for us to worship. I woke up this morning with joy in my heart. I woke up this morning with joy in my heart, uh, ready to come to you with a word from the word, uh, ready to see your faces, maybe some smiling, maybe some not. Uh, this is why I told them, keep the lights off. I don't want to see what they look like. <laughs> I don't want to see what they look like. They said, God told Jeremiah, don't be afraid of their faces. Just preach the word. I said, God, I ain't got that yet. Turn the lights off. Amen. <laughs> uh, here we are in the first Sunday of December, the last month of the year. Can I say this to somebody? I don't know what the rest of the year is going to bring for you, but I know that some of you entered into 2021 relieved that it was no longer 2020. Amen. And you were met with some heartaches, some headaches, some whatever kind of aches, even in 2021. Can I tell you that it doesn't matter what the year is, the enemy's after you, but God is faithful. I don't care what the year is. You, some of y'all are waiting for 2022, like it's going to be the year of the same thing. The enemy is coming, drama's going to happen, but God is faithful. And it is not what the enemy does. It is what I believe about what God has done, and it's how I respond. That literally makes my life. It is how I respond to God that makes my life. And so I want to encourage you as we close out the end of this year. I got a series that I want to start today. Uh, I closed one of the, my most, the, the, I, this is not a good grammar, the funnest series of my life last week. The playlist. And, and if you aren't here for the playlist, can somebody who just by witness of a shout or a clap tell me, was the playlist something that we, I mean, yeah, that, that was... That was one of my favorite series ever. We have fun. We learn. We got gut punched. We got throat punched. We got encouraged. Uh, just, it was fun. And so I, I closed that series last week, and I was like, Lord, what do we do now? And the Lord was giving me some ideas. And as we went through First Wednesday, uh, that was amazing for us who were in the room on last Wednesday night. We, we, we came in here full of gratitude, left full of joy. And here's the reality. Let me say this to those of you who weren't here. And then God started, like, lining up prophetic, powerful moves in here. And I know on a Sunday morning, you know, some of y'all like, I just came because somebody told me I should come this weekend. And I showed up. Don't be talking about prophetic stuff. I get it. But God is powerful, y'all. And he moved in a powerful way at First Wednesday. So we want to invite you uh, to be a part of all that God is doing here at Freedom Church and after this, after this service, after this worship experience, for those of you who are in the room, uh, we will have what we're calling our Faith Forward class. The first one is in person. The rest of them succinctly follow online, and there are just four of them. And, and we want you to participate in that. Both, Listen, I'm imploring new people and those who are existing to be a part of this because as we move into 2022, we're moving into a new place. Not physically. But spiritually, and emotionally, mentally, and how we're going to approach how we approach God, how we approach one another, how we approach ministry, we're moving into a new place. And so I implore you to be a part of Faith Forward. It will be on every first Sunday, but this first Sunday, I'm imploring you to be a part of it so that you can hit the ground running in January with us so that this month you'll get a picture of who it is that we, who we are and how you can live Faith Forward with us. Because here at Freedom Church, we live Faith Forward. So Faith Forward is a class that we'll have right after service uh, at 12 o'clock uh, after this word. But today, I want to start a new series, a new series by the title, Capital C Christmas. Capital C Christmas. And I don't want you to feel sorry for me, but I do want you to empathize with your boy for just a few seconds. I don't want you to feel sorry for me, but I want you to empathize with me for just a few seconds. I want you to think about being in my shoes every December when the world begins to talk about Christmas. Shoot, let's back up. Every October when the world begins to talk about Christmas, they begin to put up their decor. They begin to do all of these things. And the subtle underlying Christian line that permeates the Christian heart and thought process that gets kind of a little bit of attention uh, is there and it runs through this thread of the Christmas season and it's Jesus is the reason 
And you know the, you know the saying, you know the saying. And so, so for me, I don't want you to feel sorry for me. I want you to empathize with me that the world has continuously and continually made Christmas this bigger and more explosive production of life and uh, spending and economy and all of these things that it's made. And, and the message of Christi Christianity stays the same for us. The, the message of Jesus stays the same the same for us. And so the hype around Christians, around packages coming to your door, like 10 years ago, you know, you had to go out and physically shop. Now you literally just go on Amazon, hit buy now, and then get, get ding dong on the thing. You tell Alexa, don't be telling on me what I bought people. So you turn your notifications off. You got boxes at your front porch. There's this whole cycle of the season that happens. And I don't want you to feel sorry for me, but I want you to empathize with me because people start coming to church around the Christmas season and they're saying to themselves, I heard this before. I, I, I've heard the story before. And, and not only that, I don't want you to feel sorry for me, but I want you to empathize with me because I have to preach the message that you say you know to people who feel differently about said season. In the room, we have the bubbly people. You know when Christi Christmas comes around, these are the people that in September, they start pulling garland out of the closet. They start lining up stuff. They got a plan. Their lights are starting to go up. They got 83-foot snowmen in the front yard. They got all of this stuff having the bubbly people. They got cider recipes and all <laughs> kind of stuff for you, the bubbly people. You have the indifferent people. The people who are like, it's just another man-made holiday that people are doing, and they just want my money, and blah, blah, blah. So they don't want to hear it from a Christian or a worldly perspective. You have the frustrated people that this year was supposed to be different. But by the time they got to December, everything seemed to be the same. And so I'm frustrated in my finances, frustrated in my marriage, frustrated with myself, frustrated about my weight, frustrated about my job, frustrated people. You've got the hurting people. But the hurting people are those of us who, and I, I say this as one of you, who the holidays bring about a point of grief and reminder of those who are no longer with us. Today is December 5th, 2021. It is the 10th anniversary to the day of the death of my father in which I watched him take his last breaths consciously in a hospital room as we were preparing a sermon together. And so to have to have the assignment to preach on this day, I stand with some of you who are the hurting on this day. And I don't want you to feel sorry for me. I don't want you to empathize with me that I have to conflate all of these things and prioritize the main thing. I have to conflate all of these things, not leaving out anything. Because if I don't talk to them, they're talking about me. If I don't speak on that subject, then I'm insensitive to their issue. Yeah. Not only that, th there's the, the, the pull gravitationally to do what it is that the world is calling you to do and not to really prioritize what the season presents from a Christian standpoint. But the Lord told me this season, the best way to approach a season like this is to start with a commonplace and move forward toward specifics. And what we're going to do today is we're going to start in this common place. In this series, we're going to start in this common place, capital C, Christmas. This series is all about starting over at the beginning, starting over when Jesus came, starting over for where he came to make our lives better. The Christmas story is a beginning, the beginning of Christ's life and the beginning of our freedom. And so it means that we need to capitalize the C again in Christmas. As I thought about this, I, I tried to nerd out a little bit, and I started reading the importance of capital letters. And then I started reading that in gray at grammar school, when we learned this, we learned these letters not as capital letters first, but we learned them as uppercase and lowercase. 
if you're a real nerd, yeah, I, was just, I just nerded out this week and learned this, that, that there is really no significance to why it's called an uppercase or a lowercase from a grammatical standpoint. It is a physical thing that would happen when they had to print and typeset numbers with metal, I mean letters with metal letters. And, and because lowercase or smaller letters were used more often, they were in the lowercase yeah. to get quicker yeah. access. But they, but they had the capital letters or the bigger letters at the higher place because they were rare to be used. They were used, watch this, to go at the beginning of sentences but not throughout the sentence. They were used for emphasis on proper nouns and other things. And so they were kept in the, watch, uppercase. They had a special place. That, that, that there were certain things that were common that were used in a Lower case, but there was something that was used rarely that, that was in a uppercase. Can I tell you that what we've done with Christ and Christmas and the story of God is we've made him so common he's in the lower case. Not that we're using him often, but we have, we have kept him with everything else that we use every day almost on equal ground. And I think it's time for the believer to capitalize Christmas again. It's time for us to take the C in Christmas and put it back in the uppercase that it needs to be used, that it needs to be done, that, 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 that we need to capitalize this C again, that the first word in the word Christmas is Christ. And we need to capitalize. And I'm not here to talk about you and your argument with people when they put Merry Xmas and you like, you taking the Christ out of it. That's not what I'm talking about. Go have your Facebook fight somewhere else, but don't use my message to do it. I could even argue, I could even argue, watch this, that Xmas ain't that bad because the word Christ in the Greek is the word Christos, which is the chi, and it looks like an X inside of it. So even in the world's attempt to cross Christ out, they put him back in. But my point today is to capitalize Christmas again because this word capital where we get from the Latin caput, which means head. We want to put Christ again at the head, at the head of our lives, at the head of our culture, at the head of our uh, families, at the head of our finances, at the head of our emotions, at the head of our decisions. We want to capitalize Christ again and put him at the head. I found out in doing my research that some cultures don't use capital letters because they, they understand how to, watch this, they understand how to prioritize thoughts. Yeah. And so in prioritizing thoughts, they don't need capital letters. They just, they understand the thought and they can separate the thoughts. They can make them, they, they can adjust their thinking as they're reading. They don't need capital letters. But English is really from English and German lettering where capital letters became very popular because we have a tendency to run all of our thoughts together. And we needed capital letters to say there's a distinction between this and that. And, and our culture needed capitalization. Can I say the reason why I want to capitalize Christ again is because our culture has this tendency to not be able to differentiate Jesus from everything else. Come on that we have this tendency not necessarily to understand that Jesus is different than everyone else. Jesus is different than everything else. And because we're running all of these thoughts together, Christ told me to tell you, capitalize my name again. Make sure that people understand that there is a distinction, a separation, a difference in who I am and who it is that they serve. Many of us need to capitalize Jesus again. I want to help you emphasize the capital C on Christmas by teaching you Christmas in Colossians. Today, I want to emphasize the capital C in Christians by teaching you Christmas in Colossians. And so if you would turn to Colossians chapter number one, Colossians chapter number one, uh, what I believe Paul is getting ready to do is help us answer a question, who is this baby? Who is this baby? Christmas is the story of God come to earth in the form of a baby to live the sinless life, die the sacrificial death, to raise up out of, after conquering said death. And here's what we have to ask ourselves about this baby. Who is this baby? Like, who is this baby that shows up on the scene that shepherds begin to worship, wise men bestow gifts upon, angels begin to sing about, and all of human history is rearranged around who is this baby? baby. 
I believe Paul helps us to answer this question. But before we get to Paul, Matthew tells us in his gospel, I believe in chapter 1, verse 23, that he is Emmanuel. He tells us that he is Emmanuel. He tells us that this baby is God with us. He he tells us that this this baby is, is God made flesh, John says in John 1 and 14. This baby is God come into human history to give us an example of who it is we were supposed to be. Bars. I need you to understand who this baby is. In the title of my message, if you're taking notes, write this down. If you're not taking notes, go ahead and write this down. This baby is the God man. This baby is the God man. The baby is the God man. The baby is the God man. Paul writes the book of Colossians and reminds this church at Colossae that Christ plus nothing equals everything. This is the theme of Colossians. It is the theme of Colossians that Christ plus nothing equals everything. You don't need to add to Christ. You cannot take away from Christ. You need to actually know who he is. I pray today that you you, you got your thinking cap on today because I'm going to teach you some stuff and I want to make sure that I do it in a way that inspires you and gets you right. Here's what it is. Paul says Christ plus nothing equals everything. Colossae was a city that didn't get the hype. It, It was a city that didn't have really the big notoriety like Rome. Even to this day, y'all want to go to Rome. Paul's day, people wanted to go to Rome. Rome was that city, right? Colossae didn't get the hype. It didn't get the notoriety like Ephesus. Ephesus was a huge city where, where there was so much influence and things that happened in that day. Colossae didn't get the hype. It didn't get the notoriety like Corinth. Corinth was a major port city. It was like, it was like New York and L.A. where all the ships came in, all the good stuff, all the good fashion came to Corinth first. By the time it got to your town store, it had been in Corinth for two seasons already. But Colossae wasn't that city. Colossae had proximity to some of these cities, but it wasn't that. It was like 100 miles, I believe, from Ephesus. And and Colossae didn't get the notoriety and get the hype. They were kind of like the little brother to these other cities. I thought about us living in Tarrant County, how sometimes Tarrant County gets the short end of the stick with Dallas, and now you got Collin County popping. For those of y'all who live in Collin County, you always up in, you know, you got in your Frisco and your Plano. Everything is popping there. And nobody's talking about little old Fort Worth. That's why we had to raise a bunch of diapers for Fort Worth. And, 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 and nobody's talking about Fort Worth. Nobody's talking about Tarrant County. When I moved here from California years ago, I was moving to Fort Worth. And I would tell people I was moving to Fort Worth. And they, like, looked at me defiantly in the eye and be like, man, I hope you have a good time in Dallas. just told you where I was going. Like, what? And they, they didn't understand. You got to put some respect on Fort Worth's name. And so what happens is, right, Colossae was kind of like Fort Worth, let alone you find this little bitty church trying to make an emphasis in Tarrant County doing things for Fort Worth, but they're in Bedford? <laughs> I go across the country and I preach and I be with all these other leaders and things like that. And somebody will introduce me, like, man, this is Robert White, man, he's pastor church in Bedford, Texas, man, they're doing some great stuff. Bedford? Where's that? Colossae is kind of like Bedford. (laughs) Somebody knew about it. It wasn't a bad place to live. Wasn't getting all the hype. Here's the thing, though. God chose to include a book of the Bible directed toward the Colossian people whom other people had discounted and discarded. (laughs) I got to talk to somebody today. I don't care what other people think about you, say about you. God is thinking about you positively. God has you on his mind. He has a plan and a purpose for your life, and he is ready to move through you. You are like Colossae in certain characters. God can make seemingly unimportant things undeniably powerful and influential. That that we get one of the greatest hymns about who Jesus is out of this book called Colossians, whom nobody knew of. They didn't get the hype, they didn't get the notoriety, but because Jesus' identity came through them, the world would know who they were. And God is saying, if you're looking to make a name for yourself, why don't you surrender yourself to the name that is above every other name and watch him exalt you so that you can have what it is that he's promised you. The Colossian church had three primary extreme false teaching issues going out, though. Paul had to write this letter to these people because the Colossians were dealing with one, syncretism. Write this down, syncretism. 
syncretism. Syncretism is combining cultural ideas, practices, and beliefs with your own regardless of contradiction. Yeah. I told you I'm going to teach today if you don't mind. I'm going to teach. They were dealing with syncretism, which means they had the gospel, but they were adding cultural practices to the gospel regardless if those practices contradicted what the gospel said. It is no, nothing wrong with cultural practice. There is nothing wrong with ideas and things from the culture. The problem is when we syncretize them, make them one and on the same level with the message that the gospel has given us. Your self-help book is not the same as the Bible. Ooh. Your motivational speaker that you listen to in the morning is not equal to the word of God. You, you need to understand that the supplement is okay as long as your diet is intact. And I need you to understand that there are some people in our society who need to beware of syncretism. The Colossian church was dealing with syncretism. They were also dealing with asceticism. They were also dealing with asceticism. Asceticism is abstaining from the satisfaction of bodily and social needs, including food, drink, sex, sleep, clothes, and wealth. Here's the problem. And on one side, they took everything from the culture and made it okay. Other people in the church, because, you know, the church has since the beginning of time, you know, something that we say about the church is we got to go back to the first century church. They had issues, too, because where there be people, there be issues. But on one side, they had this syncretism where they were taking everything from the culture and making it a part of the gospel regardless of contradiction. You go over to the other side, and these extremists was like, we don't do anything that deals with that. If it makes me feel good, kill it for Jesus. Hey! And Paul is like, that ain't holy either. Nobody wants to see your bitter face, and then you say Jesus becomes to bring joy. Nobody wants to see you saying, I just cut everything out of my life. I don't have any fun. I sacrificed everything for the gospel. And they're like, I don't know if I want that. And then you go and tell them, and the Lord said that you, he came to give you life, and life more abundant. If that's abundant life, you can keep it. Asceticism. These were people who would literally starve themselves and say it was making them holier. We're not talking about fasting, setting aside the plate for a season to clear your mind and body so that you can hear from God. We're talking about people who are saying they were more holy just because they didn't eat. People who would get married or were married and deny their spouse sex because they said sex was a pleasure and that I take no pleasure in the flesh. I only take pleasure in God. To do that is sinful. Read 1 Corinthians chapter number 7. I don't have time to get into that. Y'all didn't sign the permission slip to talk about that this morning. Here it is. These were people that were saying, if you're wealthy, you're sinful. Because they felt like material wealth was something that the world gained. And if you gain material wealth, y'all know that these are the same things that are happening in the church today. Extreme legalism. That if you have a drink of this, you ain't saved. If you go to this place, you ain't saved. If you listen to Robert White preaching the playlist, you ain't saved. <laughs> Asceticism. There was syncretism, there was asceticism, and there was legalism. Yeah. The problem when we move away from Jesus is every ism starts to spring its head. Yeah. I, I could talk about America that has all of these, syncretism, asceticism, legalism, the Jewish traditions and religious practices that crept into the church at Colossae, but we also got racism, we got classism, we got sexism, we got all of the isms because we've moved Christ from capital C. And Paul says, I got a right to address this. And so the Colossian church had these issues. And Paul says, I want to deal with these issues in the Colossian church. And so he writes to them. And he says, man, I've been praying for y'all. I'm proud of y'all. I'm excited for y'all. But there are some things that y'all need to get together. There are some things that I need to clarify for you. And, and what is known as the grace, the great Christ hymn, some believe this was a hymn that was written about Jesus that Paul literally pins inside of the Colossian text. He writes it in Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20. Today, we're just going to read Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 18, because if I preach through 20, we'll be here through 2022. But I'm going to give you these three verses, and I'm going to, um, these four verses, and we're going to break down who this baby is and what you need to believe about this baby. Here's what the text says. He is the image of the invisible God. This is the baby. He is the image of the invisible God. Watch. The firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth 
visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. There's a couple of words that I want you to circle in the text. I want you to circle image. I I want you to circle firstborn. I I want you to circle all things. I I want you to circle, I want you to circle uh, uh, head. I I want you to circle beginning. I want you to circle again, firstborn. And I want you to circle preeminent. I know some of you don't have, who don't have paper Bibles are wondering, how do I do that in my Bible app? Figure it out on your own time. I got a little bit of time to get you through this text. I want to show you who this baby is and how you you see the God man, that the baby is the God man and what this means for us as we capitalize the C in Christmas. The first thing that Paul teaches us about the baby is he shows us his, watch, identity. He shows us his identity. Verse 15 says, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. He shows us his identity. Paul says, he says, you can't respect the baby if you don't know his identity. He says, you you can't respect the baby. See, the reason why we don't respect Jesus on Christmas is because I oftentimes say this, it's hard for us to move people past where we met them. You, you met somebody in a state of, of sin. You met them in a state of being messed up. You met them broke. You met them de- uh, in debt. And they begin to change their life. You still see them where you met them. The reason why Jesus could do no miracles in Nazareth is because the fact, the fact says they looked at him and they couldn't move him past where they met him. Is this not Joseph the carpenter's son? While he's doing miracles everywhere else, where they met him is where they left him. And can I tell somebody today that there are some people who've left you where they met you. You've moved on, but they've left you there. Don't you stay where their mind keeps you in prison. Jesus didn't do it and neither should you. Paul says you can't imprison Jesus because you met him as a baby. He said because if you say that you met him as a baby, you shortchange his identity. The reason why I'm starting with Christmas in Colossians is because oftentimes we start with this helpless story about a poor couple who goes into Jerusalem to have this baby in Bethlehem, and we find ourselves leaving Jesus where we met him. We feel sorry for him because there was no place for him to lay. And the Lord told me, he said, start in Colossians and work backwards. Why? Because I need you to see who it is that you're talking about when you say Merry Christmas, Jesus is the reason for the season. We need to understand his identity. We, We need to understand his identity. He is the image, the icon in the Greek of the invisible God. I need you to understand this because if you don't fully understand his identity, you will not respect his person. If you see him uh, 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 in, in what you envision him to be and he shows up in a way that is, not, that is not conducive or in alignment with what your mind sees, you'll disrespect him when he shows up. You'll disrespect him when he shows up to talk to you about your family. You'll disrespect him when he shows up to talk to you about your faith. You'll disrespect him when he shows up to talk to you about your friendships or your finances or your fitness or whatever he shows up to talk to you about. Here's what I need you to understand. You've got to recognize him or listen to somebody who does. Woo! I remember when I was a junior in high school, uh, I did the uh, college-bound Diamonds and Pearls uh, banquet. I've told some of y'all this story before, uh, but bear with me because this is so good. Uh, I did the college-bound Diamonds and Pearls banquet. I was serving as a junior ambassador. It was a banquet that was put on by the college-bound area in my church. I mean, not the college-bound team in our area. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm mixing my words up. And so what they would do is they would honor the seniors. And it was called the Diamonds and Pearls Banquet. So the seniors, they w- we had this program. We would go on like one Saturday a month, and we would study extracurricular stuff. Like, I mean, we would study like math and science like outside of school. And so Johnny Savoy was the person that had put this together, and there was a banquet for the seniors. They would get scholarships. There were people who would donate to it. It was this big deal. And so I had to do registration that year because the juniors would serve the year before they began, they, they graduated. So I'm serving at the table of this particular banquet that night, and my job was to make sure that everybody who came in had a ticket and was on the list. They gave me a specific job. Listen, I seen NFL Sunday night. You had... 
one job. So I'm going to do my one job well. I'm standing at the thing. I'm sitting at this, this deal. Everybody's coming in. Can I see your ticket? What's your name? Scratch them off the list. Check their ticket. Make sure it's authentic. Hold it up to the line. Hand it back to them. Let them on in. Same thing, right? We run it smooth until this group of dudes come through, suits and bow ties, and this old man that they kind of holding up. So they get to this gate. I mean, they get to the front, and they look like they're just going to walk past my table. Not going to happen. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Your boy is like, I got one job. And it's to let you in based on your ticket and your name on this thing. So I say, do you have a ticket? And the one dude laughs. I'm like, nah, you ain't going to laugh at this boy. I'm getting a little upset. So I say, you know what I'm saying? Do you have a ticket? Other dude looks at me like, for real? And I'm thinking to myself, these dudes are really tripping. I don't recognize all the other guys are looking at me crazy. The man, the old man in the middle is just staring. He's kind of shaking a little bit. He's a little kind of, I'm like, man, I, I understand. My man probably need to sit down. I, I, but listen, as fast as y'all give me y'all's tickets, as fast as you get these names off the list, as fast as you can take my man to his seat and he won't collapse. Y'all be good. <laughs> Everybody in there is looking at me like I'm tripping. Here's what happens. One of the dudes comes up to the table whispers in my ear, it's like, you don't recognize him? I'm like, nah. He said, man, that's Muhammad Ali. <laughs> Here's the problem. I ain't moving past where I met him. I saw him on that poster standing over my man with his fist up, body all intact, with the mouth of a person who says, float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. He had aged, he'd come in a different form, and I didn't recognize him, and I wouldn't let him in because I didn't recognize him. Somebody, though, had the wherewithal to tell me who was in my presence and say to me, listen, if you knew who was in front of you, you wouldn't ask for ID. You would understand that letting him in would change the trajectory of this whole thing. You're trying to project. Can I talk to somebody who hasn't moved Jesus? Jesus, past where you met him, if you don't understand his identity, you'll leave him on the outside of your life where he came in to benefit. You'll leave him on the outside because you see him the way religious ta religion taught you to see him. You'll see him the way your grandmama taught you to see him. But when he shows up in your life to do something specific for you, you'll miss what it is that God is trying to do. But I stand like that man with the bow tie that day to whisper in your ear, you know that's Jesus, right? And what I don't want you to do is to look back at me like I almost did to my man and be like, prove it. <laughs> and right after that, Johnny Savoy comes up. She apologizes for me and escorts Mr. Ali to the front of the room. And I felt terrible that I had boxed out the greatest boxer of all times. We see this baby's identity. Who is he? Let me give you some identity on Jesus. Jesus is God in the flesh. And many people miss him because he came in the form they weren't used to. In the Old Testament, watch this, people would see their gods and they would, they would fashion them in images that they might have decided they wanted their gods to be. This is why God says, you shall not make a carved image of me. I, I don't want to be shaped in what your mind says because when I show up in a way that does not look like what it is that you carved out, you're going to miss me. God said, this is why you can't make your God your bank account. You can't say you're being blessed because of how much you have. Because when he shows up in peace, you're still looking for prosperity. This is why you can't make God, you can't make God your beauty. Because when he shows up in mental health and your physical health fails, you say God failed. You got to be aware of how God might show up in your life. Not to say he don't want you to have all of it, but God is God. He can show up how he wants, when he wants. Getting ahead of myself. Let's talk about this, his identity. Thank God for that brother who whispered in my ear, I want to be that to you. So many people in the world, this Christian, we need you to be it for them. They need you to understand, they need to understand rather, that Jesus is the image, the icon of the invisible God. What does that mean? That means that he is, watch this, the manifestation of all that God is in front of your face. Yeah. If you want to know what God is like, read the Gospels. Yeah. You want to know what God is like, study the life of Jesus. You got the greatest, clearest revelation of who God is in the person of Jesus. And this Christmas, I want you to capitalize the C again to remind yourself of who he is. But he's not only God, he's a man. I need you to understand his identity. Because if you think that he's only God, you'll look at his life and not know that it was meant for you to mimic. 
that again. If you only think that he's God, you're accepting of the things that he did miraculously and in his divinity, but you don't look at his life and see that it was meant for you to mimic. The life that Jesus lived is the life that you are called to live too. The life that Jesus lived is also the life that you are called to. Remember, you were made in the image of God. That Jesus, watch this, is the exact duplicate replication of who God is, but you are called to live that out as well. He is the image of God. He shows us what God is like, but he is the firstborn of all creation. He shows us what it means to be human. I'm tired of people that make mistakes and use as the excuse, I'm only human. You cannot degrade what it means to be human down to the sinful form of being human because when humans were created, sin was not in the world. That means it means to be human means to be holy. It means to be human is to be godlike. To be human is to look like Jesus. That there is no humanity that accepts being in the depths. There is no humanity that just accepts being broken. There is no humanity that accepts that although we have to go through it, we do not accept it. We elevate to the place of being human. And Jesus shows us what humanity is supposed to look like. Oh, I wrote wrote this down. I want y'all to write this down. Check it out. Jesus is the mold from which humanity was shaped. Y'all missed it. Jesus is the mold from which humanity is shaped. What do I mean by that? That if we were made in the image of God, but we come out in human form, what was God's example? Somebody got it. If we were made in the image of God, that means something about who we are is a reminder to the world of who God is. What was the mold? Listen, you got to understand, you're meeting Jesus in that manger, and you won't move him past where you met him, but Jesus is eternal. He existed before all things, created all things. We'll talk about that in a second. But I need to remind you that humanity is the mold. I mean, Jesus is the mold from which humanity has been shaped. That means that when God said, let us make man in our image, he had a picture of Jesus in his hand. That the the artist who was painting the picture had a Mona Lisa sitting behind the canvas, and his name was Jesus. And every intention of who you were supposed to be was to look like him. How does Jesus' character look? That's how you're supposed to look. How is Jesus' compassion? That's how you're supposed to look. How is Jesus' power? That's how you're supposed to look. How did Jesus move in the earth? That's how you're supposed to look. Jesus is the mold from which humanity was shaped. It is his identity that helps us understand who this baby is, but it also helps us to understand who we are. The first thing that we see Paul telling us is he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. It helps us to, to, to prioritize or to, 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 to recognize his identity. The second thing that he does is he helps us recognize his authority. Write this down. I recognize his identity. Who is this baby? The baby is the God man. I recognize his identity. He's the image of the invisible God. He shows me who God is. He's the firstborn among all creation. He shows me who I'm supposed to be. But then I recognize his authority. I recognize his authority. Watch this. The authority says, watch, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things, somebody say all things. things. Somebody say it again, say all things. things. Were created through him and for him. We got to see his authority. Here's what I need you to see. Here's what I need you to see. The text says, for by him all things were created. Ultimately, God is the only creator. Say this again. Ultimately, God is the only creator. So, 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 so what do we mean? That, that in the beginning, God creates, bara is the word in the Hebrew, he creates out of nothing the heavens and the earth. Can I be theological and teach you for a minute? I just need you to understand this because so much Christianity is weak in its foundation that it gets torn down by YouTube videos. All right? Here's the thing. That God is the ultimate creator. He creates bara out of nothing, or the Latin ex nihilio. Out of nothing, God creates everything. Why? Because God sustains and is sufficient for everything. That out of himself can come anything. Right? Out of God, he can create. Now, now can, I, can I just pause and parenthetically say to somebody who says, uh, well, 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 science told me that there was a big bang. 
Cool. Let's talk about that bang. Where did the thing that bang come from? Because ultimately, there has to be something or someone that exists eternally. I don't care how you trace it. You got to think about this. This is logical. This is basic. Atheism is illogical. It's illogical. Why? Because the atoms were there. Where'd the atoms come from? You got to acknowledge eternality. You have to acknowledge eternality. And if you acknowledge eternality, you have to also acknowledge all sufficiency. Is this too deep for y'all or y'all good? Y'all good. You have to exa examine all eternality, and you have to acknowledge all sufficiency. What does that mean? That out of the one atom, everything that you see had to be in that one atom. And so you're telling me that something inanimate with no intelligence had everything in it and created all intelligence. Think about it. It's illogical. There should be a creator who is all sufficient and intelligent with an intentional purpose for everything he creates. That's Yahweh. That's the God we serve, which is good news because some of y'all, it ain't going to be good to you until it's about you. Oh, I just know because this is just, just the facts about God ain't good enough for some people. Now, I'm going to tell you, here's the reality. It's good news for you because God had you on his mind when he created you. This is why abortion is an abomination. Ooh, get quiet then. Get quiet then. Can, can I, ooh, excuse me, my, my sister came down, y'all. Excuse me. Close with I'm going to tell me. This is why abortion is an abomination. I'm not saying the person who has an abortion is an abomination. The act of killing a child that God creates is an abomination because there is only one who can give life. I'm not talking politics. I'm not talking politics. I'm talking discipleship. Woo! I could care less what the government says. This is an embassy of the kingdom. I won't. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep going. All right. I'm going to move on. <laughs> so we need to understand that God, God ultimately is creator, which means, watch this, as much as we call ourselves creators, we are only creative. Yeah. I'll show it to you in the text in just a minute. As much as we want to call ourselves creators, I'm a creator. I created this. You're not a creator. You're creative because you were made in the image of God, who is creator. Yeah. Ultimately, there is only one creator. Because when you see by definition something being created out of nothing, it is, you, you've never seen anyone create anything out of nothing. I was reading this article today about robot frogs that they've created with certain DNA that now those robot frogs can actually reproduce. Have y'all seen that? Scary, the apocalypse. <laughs> they ran, they, they like breeding robot frogs. I don't know what that's going to turn into. I, listen, every frog I see in my house, I'm killing now. I don't know if it's a robot frog. And Lord's like, why, why would you kill it? Because this might be a robot. But ultimately... <laughs> They're saying scientists created these frogs. No, they took DNA from living creatures that God created, raw materials from things that God created, and were creatively creating something that could actually reproduce. There is no way on God's green earth that a person can create out of nothing. When you find that person, you come tell me because I want to worship them. I got quiet because y'all y'all don't believe God the way I believe God. Like, I believe God so much that no man can do what God does. Ultimately, God is the only creator. Watch this. And if he is the one who created all things, which is what we just read in verse 16. Y'all remember that? We're still in text. For by him, all things were created. If he made it, he gets to tell me what to do with it. I did all of that to set you up. If he made it, he gets to tell me what to do with it. You know what my second point is, right? I understand his identity. He's God. He shows me how I'm supposed to be human. I'm going to come back to that in just a second. Why? Because he's God, and he shows me how to be human, but he also has all authority, which means he gets to dictate how life is done. He gets to tell you what's best because he created it. When I make something and give it to you for use, when you use it outside of the parameters of how I told you it was to be used, it is no longer use. It is abuse abnormal use of the product in which I created and I hand it to you for stewardship and not for ownership. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Colossians 1 and 16 says, for by him all things were created. I need y'all to get this. In heaven and on earth. 
This is so good. I don't have time to really work this, but, 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 but when you read this in the original language, like sometimes you can read the Bible and they translate the words in and on, and it's really the same word in the Greek, and then you're like, well, why didn't they translate it this way? Well, it makes more sense in the English. These are two distinct words. In heaven is the word in, but it's, it's, it's epsilon, uh, 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 nu, and then on earth is a different word. It's the word epi, epsilon, pi, iota. And here's what it says. It says, one says, in heaven, all things were created, and on earth, things were created. Here's what he's saying. He's saying that in heaven, where everything is perfect, watch this, God created it. And on earth, watch this, where change and creativity flow, God made it. So when you say, but I got an iPhone, God didn't make it. Everything on earth was created by God. Why does he not say in earth? He says, on earth, because the materials that the iPhone was created from came from God. And everything that came about on earth was ultimately created by God, but through the creativity of man. God, I'm preaching. Reason why this is important, because I need you to understand, you ain't God. Even the stuff that you're able to do came from the fact that, watch, you were made in his image, so you have creativity, but you still need to rely on the creator. He has authority, and when he speaks that authority into your life, powerful things happen when you obey. Why? Because authority should lead to two primary responses, obedience and expectation. Help me, Holy Spirit. Oh, authority should lead to two primary. If you got a kid, you should know that this is true. My authority should lead you to when I speak, you should know that I'm serious. And when I say to do it, you ought to do it on my authority. And when you do it on my authority, that's called obedience. Now, based on how you obey or not, there should be an expectation. That's a parent who parents right there. There's an expectation. If you obey... Right? There's probably some reward, responsibility, release, some, 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 some release of stewardship, release of resource, whatever it is. Because of obedience, you trust your kid more. When your kid disobeys, though, that kid should have an expectation of discipline, of consequence, of, right? Well, how is it different than our Heavenly Father in our lives? He has authority over us. And the Lord tells us that all things were created for him and by him in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things. Somebody say all things. All things were created through him and for him. And the response to authority is obedience. An expectation, my expectation in obedience to God is that my God is in control. And when I surrender myself to him because he has authority, watch the rest of the text. He says he created everything in heaven and on earth. Watch this, visible and invisible. I obey him with the things I can see so he can take care of the things I can't see. Y'all missed it. He said visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers. That means there's some stuff happening in the spiritual realm that I don't have to worry about because God's got my back because I've been obedient to him based on his authority. And what he says is, if you're obedient, you can have an expectation that you can lay hands on the sick and they'll be healed. You can have an expectation that you can say to a demon, get out of their mind and they'll go. I got an expectation based on my obedience because he has authority. When he got up out of that grave, you ate that cracker, you drank that stuff, you understand that that is just the representation of his death, but we look and we take it until he comes back for his resurrect because of his resurrection. His resurrection happens, and he tells these disciples as they go and they be a witness to who he is. Share with everybody that I'm the king. Baptize him in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But before that, he says, All authority has been given to me. Here's what I need you to understand about this baby. He came with authority. He has authority, and he's delegated authority to those who believe. His identity is your identity, but not only that, his authority now becomes your authority. This is the baby. The baby brings authority. Watch this. The reason we have low expectations of God is because of our own lack of obedience to God. You you ever disobey God? And then said, I can't pray because he mad at me. Your low expectations of God are a direct correlation to your disobedience to God. 
God don't care that you made a mistake. Well, he cares that you made a mistake. But God's authority is not based on the fact that you made a mistake. He went to Calvary for the mistake. He needs you to come to him for obedience and authority going forward. God is not tripping on what you did yesterday. God is not tripping on what you thought about me in this message. God says, how are we going to move forward? God is a God of resolution and reconciliation. And he's trying to bring this thing back together in our subconscious. we got to answer this question because if our low expectations are, are a result of our disobedience, here's the question I'm asking everybody in the room to answer because your expectations are connected to how you're, you're responding to God. If everyone responds the way I respond, then how are they responding? That's, that's something to think about. Let y'all think about it. Everybody got quiet. The reason why I want, y'all to, I want to get, you to get this is because when we say that our expectations are in line with our obedience, that means if I'm living in disobedience and also stepping away from my expectations for God to love through me the way he's called to, and my response is how they respond, nobody's getting love. If, if my response then on the other hand is, even though I'm broken, God accepts me at his throne. And God says, and at my throne I give you instructions to go and love on that other person. If I respond, then my response is their response. Everybody's getting love. Everybody's getting compassion. Everybody's getting justice. People's hearts aren't getting broken because people want to live selfishly and not holy. This is the thing. When we are responding to God's authority, our obedience and expectation begins to create revival in the earth. I need you to ask this question. When you think about God's authority, if I respond the way, I mean, if they respond the way I respond, how will they respond? And adjust your life accordingly. Here we go. Last thing. Paul teaches us about, man, I got notes, I'm skipping, priorities. He teaches us about Christ, the baby's priorities. Point number one, he teaches us about the baby's identity. Number two, he teaches us about the baby's authority. Number three, he teaches us about the baby's priority. He teaches us about the baby's priority. Here's what the text says in verse 17 and 18, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Y'all should just highlight that verse, go back and meditate on it later. Verse 18, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. I told you that the word capital comes from the word caput, which means head, which also comes and gives us our English word decapitated. Decapitated, right? Caput means head. To decapitate means to remove the head. I believe that in the 21st century, we see a lot of decapitated churches and decapitated Christians because we have the identity of Christ. Our theology is intact. Some have the authority of Christ. Their charisma is intact. Can I tell you the difference between point number one and point number two? This this is the problem with the church. There are some who want to know and have a great knowledge about God. There's that camp of Christians, but they never want to experience him. There's another camp that wants to experience God. They want the authority of God, but they don't want to know who the God is that's giving them authority. So the enemy could demonically be showing them power that is not in align with the identity. What authority are you under? So you got this identity and this authority that has to be, watch, in alignment with the priority. What is the priority? The priority is Christ is the head. When you decapitate a body, it no longer lives. And the reason why we got dead Christians and dead churches and dead religions and dead theology is because we've decapitated the body of Christ. We've cut off the head. The Bible says that Jesus is the head. He is the head of the body, the Church, notice this, all of my people who decide that they can have Christianity apart from the church. The head is the head of the body, and the body is the church. You can't have an individual Christianity. You get saved personally, but you worship corporately. You grow together. We are connected to one another. There is no such thing as a Christian without the church. Talk to me, somebody. There is an importance of this. Now, based on how we gather and what we do, there is there is loose uh, uh, freedom in that. But the Lord says this, that we are connected to one another by the head. An individual Christian, decapitated. 
a church without the identity of Christ solely in place, knowing that he is 100% God, 100% man, decapitated. A church that does not surrender to the authority and the power of God, both in the visible and the invisible, decapitated. It is a priority for us to make Christ, the Bible says in this. Let me just read again. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything, here's my favorite part of the whole text, he might be preeminent. Woo, I love it. That he might be preeminent. Christ is preeminent. Can I nerd out again for the last two minutes of this message? Here's the reality. Preeminent is a verbal adjective. I love it. Preeminent is a verbal adjective, which means it is both an action word and a descriptor at the same time. When I read it in the English, what I see is God is preeminent. That means you got to put God first. That's your adjectival uh, uh, description of Jesus, that you put him first in description. He's the head of my life. We used to testify to like that in the old school church. First giving honor to God, who is the... Come on, you know what it is. That's the adjectival title of Jesus, that he is the head of your life. The problem with that is if it's adjectival, then what it does is it depends on you to make him first. Yeah. Can I nerd out for just one more minute? If it's adjectival, then it's only up to you to make him first. That means you have to put him in that position. But the text doesn't say you put him in the position. The text says that it is a verbal adjective. The Bible says, watch this, that in everything he might be preeminent. That he might be preeminent, which means it's a verb, which is a subject that uh, uh, the verb is the action of the subject. He, being Jesus, is the subject of the sentence that he makes himself preeminent through what it is that he has done, and then you get to describe how he's moving in your life by what he's done. I love this because what it does is it takes pressure off of me. It takes pressure off of me. I don't have to look around and say, did I put God first? Did I do this? Because that's how we prioritize God in our lives. We make him first on our list and forget him when we on number three. We put him first in our list and forget him when we moved on to our next assignment. We put him first on our list, but when our calendar alarm rings and we go to something else, he has been put on the back burner. But because he is preeminent as a verbal adjective, he always makes himself the center as long as I'm walking with him and talking with him. Watch this. This is so good. Help me, Holy Spirit. Get back to my notes. Woo! It's, it's, this, it's this verbal adjective, which means it's both an adjective, action, and a description. He acted, and his action dictates the way that we describe what he's done in our lives. Preeminent implies he should be first in everything just by default. It's just who he is. It's just what he does. He shows up and he's first. And when I acknowledge him, watch this, I begin to say, whatever you want, Lord. <laughs> whatever you want, Lord. Uh, Y'all watch Coming to America. Uh, sometimes I just have no better way to describe it. Than what they did. She, she got to the place where she would do whatever he said. And her response to him was, whatever you like. Whatever you like. And for some of you, you laugh at that level of relationship, but the truth of the matter is, that's how you get your king. Hey. Yeah, 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 no, no, Simi was, Simi was on some other stuff, and he went to go find somebody else, but the reality is, the way the kingdom works is that the bride says to the king, whatever you like. And when the Lord shows up and I see what he's done for me, has chosen me as a bride out of an undeserving place, but elevated me to a place of the throne. When he says, jump on one leg and bark like a dog, I say, whatever you like. And you find me there 20 years later in the sequel doing what it is that he told me to do because he gave me the strength to get it done. Yeah, I wish somebody would preach with me. Watch. Capital C means he is at the beginning of every sentence and statement of your life. Yeah. It means that every sentence and statement of your life means he is capitalized there. Yeah. It's, the, it's, it's, it's like when you're in elementary school and you get the honor of being the line leader. Yeah. Jesus says, I want to be the line leader. Yeah. Every line and facet of your life, I want to be the line leader. He deserves the priority because of what he's done. And that should lead to our description of him as first. Watch this. Priority closes the gap between proximity and intimacy. I'm, 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 I'm closing with this. Priority closes the gap between proximity 
and intimacy. Follow me. Get your permission slips ready because I'm going to go a little deep here. Here we go. You, you, you ever been next to someone who just wasn't there? Proximity and intimacy don't have to be, the, they're not the same thing. You've been next to, like people have been next to me and I'm in a different world. You can sit with me in a room and I'm, I'm far off into June 2022, like planning, talking, thinking, sometimes worrying. I could be somewhere else, but in proximity. But when I prioritize your presence, I move from proximity to intimacy. Uh, uh, if you are uh, single or, or, or maybe not married, you might want to miss me for the next two and a half minutes. Here we go. Uh, when we, we, we can't get any closer to God than having his spirit in us. So, so, so the problem that we have as Christians is not a proximity problem. The spirit of God lives in you. Uh, married people, follow me. Uh, <laughs> That, 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 that the problem is not proximity. The spirit of God is in you. The problem is intimacy. It, it is the same thing in the marriage bed that many of you have proximity in the same bed, even in the same app, but there's no intimacy because there was no priority. Because there was no priority, there was something, someone the Holy Spirit is in you, but that doesn't mean he's intimate with you. I'm trying not to say it, don't matter. That, that you need to understand that proximity and intimacy are different. But priority closes the gap between proximity and intimacy. And the problem with us is we've decapitated God. And we're expecting intimacy from God when we need God. It's like the husband who taps over at 3 in the morning and saying, you up? But he ain't acknowledged her all day. Some of y'all women do it too. Women got quiet. I'm not even amen in you. <laughs> Proximity and intimacy are different. And God called us to prioritize our relationship with him so that we're not just walking with God. But we're talking with God, and we're hearing God, and we're sharing with God. God says, no longer do I call you servants. I call you friends, because servants don't know what the master is up to. God says, I want to reveal plans and promises and purposes to people, but that comes from a place of priority. If you won't prioritize him, why would he place plans in your hand? If you won't prioritize him, why would he place the future in your mind? If you won't prioritize him, why would he place power in your limbs? Here's what the Lord told me to tell you, that when we prioritize God, everything begins to change. Everything that you've imagined, everything that you've desired, everything that you've wanted. The Bible says that when he becomes preeminent, everything changes. But it starts with us capitalizing, doing what baby said. Putting some respect on his name. I think, I think, I think the thing I want y'all to do for the rest of this capital C Christmas is when you hear the word Christmas, I want you to go back to his identity. Begin to think of the God who became flesh and dwelt among us, who is the mold of what it is that I'm supposed to be. I want you to think of the God who created all things and in his authority gave us authority over things visible and invisible, over the stuff I can see and the stuff I can't see. I ain't worried anymore because I got power. And I want you to prioritize him and say, God, I don't want you just for your stuff and who you are. No, that's using him. That's transactional. God, I want intimacy with you. So that I can fully understand who it is that I'm supposed to be and how it relates to you and how we can walk in partnership together and enjoy this thing called life. Some of y'all just going through the motions. I'm trying not to go back to that husband-wife thing. Some of y'all just going through the motions with God. Getting it over with on Sunday because he asked you to. But when we get intimate with God, we run to the place of his presence. And enjoy our time with him. And leave and tell everybody, I'm in love, y'all. <laughs> How does that start? It starts by you accepting who Jesus is. Stand on your feet. It starts by you accepting who Jesus is. Honoring and knowing it. And in a way, saying, God, I, I want all of what it is that he was just talking about. That identity piece. God, I believe that you are the son of God. I don't, 
fully understand all of it. And I, I pray that in the days ahead in 2022, we're working on some things where we're going to create a foundation class that gives you the foundations of all of this stuff and so that you understand it fully and theologically. Uh, I don't want us to be a shallow church. I don't want us to be a church that can shout about what, what's coming and the breakthrough that's getting ready to happen. But we can't shout on the hypostatic union. The fact that Jesus is 100% God and 100% man, which shows me that God cared enough about me to come out of heaven into earth, show me how I was supposed to live, but because I couldn't live that way, died for me. We should get excited about that. If you're here today and you're saying, listen, I want to take the first step toward that, what we're we going to do in just a moment, I'm going to pray. I want you to make a decision about your next step with God. Here at Freedom Church, we, we, we exist to move people into freedom through the love and power of Jesus Christ. In short, we want to live faith forward. We, we want to live faith forward. And you need to take your first step forward today by saying, God, I surrender my life to you. I understand the identity of you being the God man. I understand the authority of me giving my life to you because you're cre you created all things, including me. And so I'm giving myself over to you. And I, I want to prioritize our relationship. Three kinds of people in the room today. One, the one who needs to give their life to Jesus and say, I surrender it today. God, I'm changing today. This is a new life. This is a new day. December 5th, 2021. This, this is my first birthday of my new Christianity. You're going to mark this day as a spiritual marker. And you're going to give your life to Jesus today. You can do that when the prayer team comes up here and tell them. Or you can go right outside of these doors to the right and around the corner to our hub. And you can tell somebody there. Or you can text forward to 94000 and let us know that you want to give your life to Jesus. There's another type of person here. There's a person who's saying, you know what? I need to reach into that uppercase drawer, pull out the capital C, and say, God, I'm prioritizing you again. This Christmas season, you know, you got your budget. I'm grateful for that. You know what you're spending. You know what you're buying what for. You've already got your list. That's fine. I'm not telling you to change that. I'm telling you to rearrange what's going on in your heart. I'm telling you today, you're saying, God, I'm, I'm rearranging some things. I, I have made you a part of the list, but you weren't first in preeminence. So God, today I'm changing that. There are believers all over this room who need to make that decision today. You need to make that decision. The third person, the third person that's in the room is like, man, you ain't hit nothing that I'm going through right now. Now Jesus covers everything that you're going through, but the way I said it, the presentation of it, didn't necessarily hit home with you today. And that's okay. I'm not here for that. But we are. I came to bring the word that God told me to bring today to our corporate body. But there's an individual in here who's hurting, who's struggling, who's wanting to celebrate, who's wanting something. The prayer team is going to be down here. So here's what I need for you to do. I need you to come and receive prayer for whatever it is that you're going through today. Giving your life to Jesus, come. If you're reprioritizing your relationship with Jesus, come. If you need something that I ain't even mentioned, come. When I say amen, you can move. Father, in the name of Jesus. Thank you for your word. Thank you for what it is that you have done in this moment and in this room today. God, I pray that we would be a people like the people in Colossians that are reminded of who you are in your identity, your authority, and your priority. And that will begin to change everything about what it is that, how we live our lives and what it is that we do. God, I pray for every person that needs to come for prayer, whether they're giving their life to you, recommitting their life to you, or for some other reason. Give them Holy Spirit boldness to come down and to receive prayer in this moment. In Jesus' name, amen.